Hello there and welcome to Reedy's online service. Thanks again for tuning in. We really do appreciate you tuning in and our prayer is that God may speak into your life. Would you please pray with me? Father God, thank you for this opportunity now to open up your word. I pray, Father God, that you may speak into our hearts. Give us a word of challenge, but also a word of encouragement, what we need to hear today. I also want to pray, Lord, for any person that is watching, Lord, for whatever reason they couldn't get to church. I know that some are not well, Lord. We pray that your healing hand will be upon them. I know, Lord, that there are those who just got various disabilities, Lord, that they're finding it really tough to get to church, Lord. Continue to be with them. And other people, Lord, I just pray, some of them on holidays, may they have a, a, a wonderful blessing uh, on their time away, Lord. So thank you for this opportunity now to share your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And today our word comes from 1 Timothy chapter 6, starting at verse 11. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God, who gives life to everything, and of Christ Jesus, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of all kings and Lord of all lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in inapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see. To him be glory and might forever. Amen. At Reedy, we are going through the New Testament in 90 days challenge. How are you going with it? Today we are up to 1 Timothy chapter 6, particularly looking at Paul's encouragement to Timothy to flee, to pursue and to fight. It's another wonderful passage for followers of Jesus Christ. Now, the context of this passage is that Timothy was one of the few Christians in the great city of Ephesus. Timothy has been placed in Ephesus with a serious task to defend the gospel of Jesus Christ and to put straight those who were seeking to undermine the gospel message and ministry. And so there was a lot of challenges facing Timothy with not many that he could lean on for support in those young years of the church. Therefore, Paul wrote to encourage Timothy. And the Spirit of God has preserved these letters because they are an encouragement to us who must face difficulties and demands in our world today. Paul addresses Timothy with an unusual title, calling him man of God. This is a remarkable word. In the Old Testament, this title was reserved for prophets and leaders like Moses and Samuel, David, Elijah, Elijah and Elisha, as well as several other unnamed prophets. But in the New Testament, only Timothy is addressed this way. It must have meant a great deal to Timothy to have the Apostle Paul call him a man of God. Now, I'm not sure what you think, but to have someone say that to you as a follower of Jesus will be a great honour. Everyone who has the Spirit of God indwelling in them has the ability to have that title for themselves to be a man or woman of God. Not a person of the world, not a person of the flesh, but a person of God. Here's a question that I would like to attempt to answer in this message. What does a man or woman of God do in a world like ours? In the world that is driven by money, success, power, ego, acceptance, image, what does a person of God do in a world like ours? There are three imperative verbs here that mark what Paul said to Timothy that he ought to do. First, flee from all of this. 
Second, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. And third, fight the good fight of the faith. Remember these three verbs, flee, pursue, and fight. I want to look at these imperatives because they are helpful for us to be a follower of Jesus in today's world and tomorrow and the next day. First, Paul says, flee from all of this. Elsewhere in scripture, we are told to flee certain things. We are to flee immorality and idolatry always, as Paul told the Corinthians. Peter says that we need to flee from lust, which wages war against our souls. There are times in our Christian life when the only defense we have is to get up and go, to flee from these things. Paul here is referring to what he had just wrote about in the previous paragraph in verses 2 to 10 about false teaching. Timothy is to flee these three characteristics of false teaching. The first characteristic is conceit. That is, taking pride in knowledge and relying upon that as a basis, basis for our success. Paul says this in verses 3 and 4. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching, they are conceited and understand nothing. If we are going to be men and women of God, we are to flee conceit in any form. The second characteristic is the love, the love of controversy. Paul wrote in verses 4 and 5, They are conceited and understand nothing. They have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, envy, suspicions, and constant friction between people of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. Some people love to get into an argument going among the people in the church. This is the mark of a false teacher, that they always want to form a faction around the idea that they have is different from everybody else's. That is to be fled from. The third thing is greed, the love of money, the hunger for material gain. Verse 10 says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. And so Paul tells Timothy to flee these things. They will only create difficulty in life. During the week, my daily devotions was about Joseph in Genesis chapter 39 and the wife of Potiphar. Now, Potiphar was the captain of Pharaoh's guard. And the story tells that Potiphar had trusted Joseph to be in charge of his entire household. A great honour. Potiphar could leave Joseph unintended and still trust him to act honourably and fulfil his responsibilities. But the same could not be said for Potiphar's wife. Not only was Joseph a young man, but we are told that he was very handsome. And as the days turned into weeks and weeks turned into months, Potiphar's wife became very attractive, attracted to this Hebrew slave Joseph. So attractive, in fact, that she pursued an adulterous affair with Joseph. Joseph refused her advances because he knew that it was dishonourable to sleep with the wife of his master, who he deeply trusted him, and because it was also a sin. Yet, despite his rejection of her advances, Potiphar's wife continually tried to seduce Joseph into having an affair. Joseph remained strong and refused. He even avoided her to try to prevent these confrontations, according to verse 10 of Genesis chapter 39. Well, the situation came to a head when Potiphar's wife cornered Joseph and grabbed him. This time, Joseph had to literally flee. 
We read in Genesis 39 verse 11, she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. Joseph fled so fast that he left his garment in her hands. Well, this led to a series of lies and deception by the wife, but gradually a victory for Joseph. Sometimes we just got to flee. Paul's second imperative is to pursue. Verse 11 says, Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. I like what Andy Degana has written about this. Both the command to flee and the command to pursue assumes haste and speed. As Timothy runs away from false teaching, he is to run headfirst in the direction of righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Andy suggests that these six virtues come in three pairs and are kind of like a, a shorthand for the whole of the Christian life. The first is righteousness and godliness which refers to objective obedience. Either we are living righteously and in devotion to God, or we are not. The second two, faith and love, look at active obedience. Here, faith is the simple trust that God is who he says he is and will do what he says he will do. Do we trust him? That is demonstrated first and foremost by our love. It is by our love that all people will know that we are Christ's disciples. Now, just some further thoughts on biblical love. I mean, how many times in Scripture do we have the urging that the mark of a true Christian is that they are a loving person? Owe nothing to anyone, Paul says in Romans 13 verse 8, except for your obligation to love one another. Here in this very letter to Timothy, Paul opens with the words, The purpose of my instruction is that all believers would be filled with love. This is such a challenge for me. Are my words and actions filled with love? There are times I have to realize that the love that God has given me is not always coming through. Yet, this is the mark. Above all else in our relationship with people, the sign that we have really been touched by the Spirit of God is that we are becoming loving people. Is our home becoming a loving home? That is also the mark of a growing church. I do not care about how big the numbers are. That does not tell a thing. Some of the cults can fill the largest halls, but numbers do not mean the church is growing. It is when the people are growing in love that you have a church that is alive. That is why love is a value at Reedy that we are striving for. So just going back, we have the pair of righteousness and godliness, that we are to either live righteously and in devotion to God, or we are not. The next pair is faith and love. Do we have that simple trust in God that he is who he says he is and will do what he says he will do? That is demonstrated first and foremost by our love. And the last pair, endurance and gentleness. And they describe submissive obedience. That means hanging in there, refusing to give in. That is one of the most contagious things in life, isn't it? When things get tough and somebody says, I've had it, I'm not going to try anymore. It is amazing how quickly people pick up on that note and say, hey, me too, it's not worth it. Soon people all around you start quitting. On the other hand, if just one person will say, sure, it's tough, but let's keep going. God is with us. Somebody else will pick that up and will spread through those whom that you mix with. Unwillingness to quit is the mark of a Christian man or woman of God in the midst of the world that has just gone wrong. The word gentleness is found only here in the Bible. While it doesn't change the way that we translate it, the term indicates not only a gentle demeanor, 
but also a gentle response in the face of aggressive offence. Paul says, pursue these things. Make a mental list of these qualities. There are only six of them. Righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance and gentleness. Ask yourself every day, is this happening in my life? There is no more practical guideline in the scriptures than Paul's word in 2 Corinthians, where he says, examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. Test yourselves. Something every Christian ought to do every day is to take a quick mental checkup and ask yourself, how am I behaving? What's happening in my life? Where is it all coming from? This is especially true if you want to affect the day in which you're going to, to live. During the week, a new song came up on my Spotify and it grabbed my attention. I really enjoyed it. Her name is Katty Nicole, someone that I've never heard of before, but that's okay. There's a lot of Christian singers that I haven't heard before. But her song, Jesus Changed My Life, grabbed my attention. I loved her words that it was like a, a testimony of how Jesus has changed her life. So it made me search for more of her songs and I discovered that her album has only just been released. The first release single from this album is titled In Jesus Name, God of Possible. The song has not only reached well over 150 million people already, but it was the second highest position on the iTunes overall top song chart, while remaining number one on the iTunes Christian and Gospel chart since the song was released just a few weeks ago. The song was created from the words in Katty's prayer journal that were written in the midst of the global pandemic crisis and in response to her own story of suffering, hope and healing. Prior to writing In Jesus' Name, God of Possible, Katie was diagnosed with scoliosis and underwent surgery to strengthen her spine, which led to persistent post-surgery pain that sent her into a bedridden mental and emotional spiral. Three years later, Katie went back in for an operation to essentially remove those metal rods and screws that had been placed into her back. She wrote, I go into the second surgery and I came and I come out of it. And the smoke cloud of depression was gone. I encountered the Lord in that moment. When I got my x-rays after surgery, my spine was actually straighter than when the rods had been in it. So when I say that God can do miracles, I mean it because I've seen it. She believes that God was a part of her story when she was suffering and is still part of her story when she is now letting people know who he is and what he can do. Katie has continued to write, There's no story that doesn't matter to God. Every story was written by him and he's the greatest author of all time. God has healed me and so I know he can heal someone else. I'm going to share my story and hope it will encourage others to go and share theirs. Tell me I'm no good Chapters that define me for so long But the hands of grace and endless love Dusted off and picked me up Told my heart that hope is never gone
Through her ups and downs, Catty pursued righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. She didn't give up. The third word for the person of God is fight. Verse 12 says, fight the good fight of the faith. The Christian life is a battleground. Many people have trouble here. They are always hoping that the battle will end. Who doesn't? That the enemy will give up and just go home and they can begin to enjoy life without any troubles. That would be nice, wouldn't it? But it never happens because this life is a battleground and we must never forget that. God certainly gives us times of peace and times of enjoyment. But remember, there is a ruthless enemy who knows exactly how to get at us how to discourage us and how to make us angry with each other and how to plant seeds of hostility and unrest between husband and wife in a family or even in a community. And he's always going after us about that, those things. Well, Paul tells us how to fight the good fight of faith. Verse 12 says, Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. This is very similar to those famous words that we looked at last week from Ephesians chapter 6, where Paul says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Ray Steadman has written that to put on the whole armour of God and to take hold of that eternal life are one and the same thing. That armour is Jesus Christ. His strength, His wisdom, His love, His gentleness, His peace is appropriated in your life. He is in charge of what is happening to you and you rest on that fact. That is the way you fight the good fight of faith. That is the way you take hold on your life eternal. That is what happened to Timothy. At funerals, when I hear someone say about the deceased that they have fought the good fight, that they've finished the race and have kept the faith, I have prayed quietly, Lord, may that be said of me. So the person of God does three things in life. They flee from certain things. They pursue after the qualities that are listed. 
and they fight the good fight of faith by taking hold of the provisions of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Paul closes this section reminding Timothy about the greatness of the one he serves. He wrote in verse 16 about God. He alone can never die and he lives in light so brilliant that no human can approach him. No human eye has ever seen him nor ever will. All honour and power to him forever. Amen. God is the giver of life according to verse 11. Do you sometimes feel beaten and rejected, battered by more things than you can handle at the end of your strength. We all need a renewed vigor and renewed vitality and strength. And that is what we get when we turn to Jesus, as our reading says, and see him as the victor. This is part that the prayer plays in our life. We have all experienced the infusion of new strength and courage from God when we have turned to him in prayer in that moment of pressure. Christ is given to us that we might not lose heart when the times of discouragement come our way. Turn to him as the author of life. Paul closes with a final word about the greatness and the majesty of God. There is no more moving passage in all of Scripture than this, where God is set forth in his sovereign might. Verse 15, God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Ah, oh, the world is tense. Life is challenging. The flaming arrows from the devil are flung towards us and yet through the power of the Holy Spirit, we are told to flee from all of this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness, and fight the good fight of the faith. God, the giver of life, source of all power, he is with you. Thank you so much for listening to me today. Would you please bow with me in a word of prayer? Oh, Father God, I just pray, Lord, in this crazy world that we live in, this world that is full of tension, where there are many arrows of the devil being flung at us, Lord, when times just seem just too hard to bear, Lord, I just pray, Father God, that you help us to, to flee. Flee from the stuff that we know is not right, Lord. Help us to pursue Jesus, his righteousness and gentleness. And Lord, help us to fight the fight of good faith. Please, Lord, please help us. Father God, thank you for this message that Paul gave to Timothy all those years ago that is still so relevant to us today. Help us, Lord, to take our stand in you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.